Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, legendary frontman and actor, Huey Lewis. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. Another exciting edition of the Rich Redman Show, where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. I'm coming to you from sunny Los Angeles. My co-host, sidekick, co-producer, longtime friend, Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com, joining us from Music City. Jim, I always say I'm excited about my guests, but today is a big one because this gentleman has been part of the fabric of American pop culture as a frontman, as a musician, as an actor for four decades. Huey Lewis, how are you doing, man? She's making me feel old. Oh, man. Hey, it's, it creeps up. I just had a big, you know, birthday. Fifth, the big five O, oh, man. I have no sympathy for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> You're a well, child. <laughs> well, when you were on your trajectory, like enjoying all this massive success, the, the Back to the Futures and the gold records and the preferential treatment and the limos, um, I think I was 15 years old. So, Jim, about the same. Jim may have been 10. You're the soundtrack was, of our youth. I was about four or five years old. <laughs> I mean, just incredible. And, and you're celebrating a lot of, of, of milestones. I mean, the band has been together a long, long time. We're at like 35 years for Back to the Future, are we not? Right around the 35, Back to the Future, yep, yep. Incredible. Now, I don't know if you remember this, about two, three, could be four years ago, I saw you guys at the Skirmer Horn Symphony Center in Nashville. Do you remember that show? I do remember that show. Yeah. It's a beautiful building. Wow. Gorgeous. Yes. Very nice acoustics, you know. It, good too, as I remember. Yeah, which is, you know, you, that's rare. Yeah. yeah. Now, I was, I kind of went backstage with some of the Yamaha guys to talk to your longtime drummer, Bill. Okay. And um, sure. how long is, have you been playing with Bill? Has Bill been the, was Bill the first drummer in the band? How, take us back. Yeah, well, Bill, Bill, Bill was in, Bill and I went to uh, middle school. Well, it's now middle school. In those days, it was junior high. Yeah. In eighth grade, and he was in seventh grade. So when we first met. But although we didn't really know each other, different crowd. And then um, he played, he and Johnny played in a band called Sound Hole, and Mario played in a band called Sound Hole, and Sean and I played in a band called Clover. And we were like rival Marin bands for years. And then uh, Clover got signed to. Uh, Phonogram Records in Britain. We moved to England for two years and so on. And then when that band broke up, I always I always liked the way Billy played, and I always thought he was a good guy. I liked that ball as well, and I liked Johnny. So I just we, it was just natural, you know. We took Mario, Johnny, Bill, me and Sean, and then we got Chris as the guitar player. Yeah. <laughs> So and we're neighbors. We're neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we wanted to uh, give a shout out to our buddy Chris Cohen for connecting us with this. And he said, make sure you bring up the fact that Huey used to tell Bill to hit him, man. Hit him. I guess when you guys were on a trajectory. And I mean, how would you define Bill's drumming? Is it like, is he, he's a soul drummer, Bill, right? Bill, Bill is a very good drummer. And he's also, Fair. he can swing. He's a swing drummer. He's a jazz drummer, too. But Bill is also a really good musician. Yeah. Good player. He's a good singer. He's got great ears. He's he can write. He's, he's, Bill is a, is a, and what's nice about him is that's what he, he lends that to, to, to his drumming. It's not just rhythm. He doesn't just give you the rhythm. He plays the song, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and, yeah. And I think that's, uh, uh, you know, that's a, that's a strong suit for him. But I remember that gig at the, uh, at the Scrimmerhorn. Right. That was, that's right. That's right. That was a fun one. Go, no, no, sorry. Now you guys have got a new one out, Weather, that dropped last year, and I'm probably right in saying that you dropped that and you weren't able to go out and support it because of all this calamity in the universe. Uh, and I lost my hearing three years ago. I lost my left ear. I'm actually having a really good day today. Great. So, a hundred percent in the left ear? No, my right ear I lost 35 years ago. I've only had like 10% hearing in my right ear for, for years. I went to the EMT guy and said, you know, I lost my hearing. He said, he said, get used to it. <laughs> I said, what? 
I said, I just lost my hearing in my right ear. I can't hear anything. He said, get used to it. He says, I said, but I'm a musician. I'm a singer, you know. He says, hey, Brian Wilson had hearing in one ear. Jimi Hendrix had hearing in one ear. Wow. I have hearing in one ear, and I'm in a barbershop quartet. I said, wow. Really? Yeah. So, I just, so then I existed on one ear, basically, for all these years, until three years ago, January 27, 2018, I lost my left ear. And it, and it was, now I couldn't hear anything. And now it's kind of episodic. I have long periods where I lose, I lose, I can't hear anything. I have hearing aids in now. Ah, I Bluetooth right. to the computer and I Bluetooth around. So I'm very manageable with technology, but I can't hear music yet. I, I, I'm, oh, hoping, wow. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, certainly not loud. Level is the devil. You know, if I, if I, if I have a, if a song comes out of the computer, and I listen to it in the computer. It's real small and compressed. I can hear pitch and I'm fine. But if it's, as soon as it gets loud, or if I would jump in with your band, oh my God, it just is cacophony for me. I can't, can't find pitch. Wow. Because I was going to say, is, is the news an in-ear monitor band or a floor wedge band? We're in-ears. Yeah. We're all in-ears. Except for Johnny. Johnny's never in ear. Johnny's never been in-ears. Johnny, Johnny, is it, but he he has a little wedge. Yeah, Johnny plays has a little wedge. Yeah, I had heard a, a story about Alex Van Halen on tour one time, and how he started out, I believe, on his monitor because back then he had a massive monitor next to him. He's like, oh yeah, I would start out around three. At the end of the tour, it'd be on ten. Yeah. Well, is that the same kind of situation? Well, this, over you know, the years, the music didn't help. You know what I what I have is a, a combination of uh, narrow eustachian tubes. Probably had a lot of earaches mm. as a kid, and then of course loud music. You know, in ear doesn't help. And now right. I'm seventy years old, so I'm not a spring chicken either. So all of this stuff come up. They call it Meniere's disease. And Meniere's mm. disease is they call it it's a disease. It's really a syndrome based on symptoms. If you have vertigo. Occasional if you have bouts of vertigo that last longer than 20 minutes, but not longer than two hours. And you have fullness in your ears and tinnitus and hearing loss sometimes, in one, especially in one ear. They call it Meniere's. Ah. And, and, and they don't know what it is. You know, they were, I've been everywhere. I've been to um, uh, House Ear Institute, been to Stanford Ear Institute, I've been to UCSF, been to Mayo Clinic. I've been to uh, talk to Mass General Eye and Ear. Steve Roush, he's the kind of the granddaddy of them all. And nobody knows anything about this. It's one of those things they just don't know. The inner ear is so protected and complicated, they can't get in there. There's no surgery possible. And, uh, but it's weird. It's its own thing. It fluctuates still. And, and there's all kinds of cases where it's, hearing comes back. A lot of people lose their hearing, but 60% of the time it comes back. And then, then a lot of times it's... You know, I'm in the 40 years, unfortunately. Right. Has anybody approached you about being a spokesperson for the syndrome or, you know, the public yeah, awareness? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. And I've done a few things. But the, the problem is there's nothing that can be done with this. I have a dossier this thick of people that have sent me letters that have been cured of Meniere's or know somebody that's been cured of Meniere's. And, and, and what, what happens is this stuff can come and go and people, tr and, there, and there's no real, you know, Western science that doesn't know nothing about it. So consequently it's rife with all kinds of other kinds of theories and people, sometimes their hearing gets better and they credit it to whatever treatment they just had. Wow. And, and so, uh, you know, but there's, and, and like right now, today, I'm having a good day. Go figure. Good. That is great. I, you know, my, my bass player, Tully, you know, and the young, we, I've been playing with the same guys for 21 years. So, you know, that story of finishing each other's sentences. It's a pretty special thing. You have another 20 to go. At 20, like, well, you know, it could happen, you know, because my, you know, my boss is like, let's do that. He's ready. He's like, man, if it's safe to go back tomorrow, I let's go do this. Uh, um, you know, touring nonstop for 16 years. And then all of a sudden, March 13th last year, it's like Live Nation's like, what? That pulling the plug. We got to see what's going on with this thing. Um, but he would just literally just come up right to my crash symbol over my high hat and just like stick his ear up and it like, it's glorious. I want to lose my hearing. Come on, Richie. You know, it's just like, <laughs> it's just because a drum set is like the volume of like a jet airliner taking off. It is. It is. It's those crash symbols, man. You say yeah. they're right ear level. 
Right. Come right at it. I sat in with Joe Cocker every night. And, and when we went over with him, I mean, his drummer is great, great drummer. I can't remember the cat's name, but man, was he loud. And, 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 and you know, that, that, you're right. I mean, that, that and that he, uh, snare drumming and, and that crash cymbal right there. Oh, that could have, depend on what era that was. It could have been uh, Kenny Aronoff, you know, the bald guy. Uh, when, when Kenny Aronoff. Wasn't Kenny? I know. Uh, I should probably know who played with Joe. Hmm. Could have been Jack I Bruno. I got something come to mind. Who? Yeah, could be. Jack yeah, Bruno. Been. Jack yeah. Bruno, he played with uh, Tina Turner maybe, forever. Maybe it is. Maybe it is Jack Bruno. Yeah, and he's a Nashvilleian now. He loud? He's a loud guy, yeah. Loud and funky. <laughs> Loud, <laughs> so, so you probably talked about this a million times, but, but you, I got this on the wiki. You get a perfect score on your math uh, SAT, and you're like, maybe I'll go to school for engineering. You're like, no, this is not me. I want to play music. You're backpacking across Europe. This is what's the chronology there, and how did you discover the harm? Are you a honer guy? Do you play a honer no, harmonica? No, uh, well, I did for years and years. I, I play Daniker harmonicas now. Yeah. Uh, was a guy named Tony Daniger who worked for Honer and makes these custom harps that are just phenomenal. But Honer's now caught up. You know, Honer went went absent for a while, and they had no, they you know they 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 were just little toys for them. And they and then finally they realized that it's a real instrument. And Honer's back on the case now. They oh, that's great. Out to another company called you know some some Taiwanese company that's doing. They're, they also have guitars and you know everything, but yeah, yeah. But, but they got a guy on the case, and they're building good harmonicas again. You have a thing called a Crossroads, then, or I think it's Crossroads or Cross Harp or something they call it, and um, and another uh, what a kind of uh, Marine Band Pro or something they call it. Yeah, that. but they're good, you know. And um, but yeah, I play Daniker harmonicas, but yeah. Uh, because yeah. I used to play sonar drums, and they were made by the same the same parent company that made the Honer harmonicas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very well, cool. Yeah, they. they uh, yeah, I mean, finally, they're, they're they've. It's an instrument. It's a proper instrument. You know, yeah. <laughs> thanks to Howard Levy. Thanks to Howard Levy. So you fell in love with that instrument, and what, who are the people that were kind of like that gave you the music bug? Because oh. I know it's R and B, it's soul music. Right, your story. Uh, you know, my old man was a jazzer. You know, my old man was a, a drummer, wasn't he? A doctor, but he, my old man was a drummer. Nice. He was Sutton, the world's greatest jazz band. And he and he'd swing like crazy, man. And perfect time, my old man. Just yeah. bad time. Yeah. Gene Krupa. He would put me on the drums when I was a kid. At one, two, three. We had a set of drums always set up in our living room. Big band jazz. And he would put me on the drums and make me scramble eggs, you know. Just. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I go, he said, and he said, you get time. Said, you got to have time. And he would just keep, tell me over and over again, you can't teach time. You got to have time. Yeah. Man, where's the shit you can learn, you know? So, and, so it started with me. and then I, then he, I went away to prep school. He, my, he and my mother split up. My mom was a wild cookie hippie and a uh, long story, but they split up. And now my old man, uh, convinced me to go to prep school for four years after which I got accepted to Cornell. But at that point he said, you know what, do uh, one more thing you're going to make you do. And then you do whatever you want for the rest of your life. Don't go to college. Not yet. I tell you what, take a year off and bum around Europe. I said, well, I was already playing harmonica. But the way I got the harmonicas was when my parents split up, my mother rented a room to a boarder called uh, Billy Roberts who wrote, Hey Joe. He was a folk singer, wrote Hey Joe, and he, he had harmonicas with he play in the little Bob Dylan yeah. race. And he gave me old harmonicas. So I'd been playing harmonicas so much. Go bum around Europe. I took the harmonicas and I played. I busked everywhere throughout Europe. And then I went back. I took a year absence, a leave of absence from college. And went and bussed around Europe. Then I went back to Cornell and, you know, Joined bands. I went to Cornell for five minutes over a two-year period. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty cool of your dad. I mean, my dad was like, Rich, you're going to college, and you don't yeah. take a break. Just get it. When you get it, you're going to be 21 years old. You'll, and you have the rest of it. That's pretty cool advice, man. That's well, he always – he my, my old man reckoned that a lot of people, they don't figure out what they want to do till later on in life. And now you're already – you know, you're, you're, you've been trained for this career that maybe you don't really like. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, what happened with me is after I toured Europe, you know, I'm, I'm busking, living by myself, playing music. Now I go back to engineering school at Cornell. 
I walk into engineering, you know, physics class, and I look around, and it doesn't look like a lot of fun. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so so uh, the, the decision was right there for me. Yeah. I, I did well because I'd been in prep school and had most of the stuff before. So I didn't really have to even go to class because I was advanced placement in prep school and stuff. And I could, I could just coast through the, the work. That's awesome. Until it caught up with me and then I dropped out. <laughs> Jim, did so you, you have a question? Have parents that said you need that you need to have something to fall back on. That's what we had. Yeah, right, 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 right. right. Something to fall you back. didn't have your parents weren't like that. No, they were just like, no, hey, man, go man, for it. Man. No fall back on. No fall back on. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Our, my my brother and I, our parents were like, yeah, you know, that's that's nice. The music thing. My brother's a piano player and a huge admirer of you and your band. Uh, he had a question that he wanted to make sure that was asked during the show, sure. but. Yeah, our parents were basically just, you know, that's that's nice. Uh, you know, go to college. I did, I you know, I was saying the same thing. I, I was there for about two minutes, and I was done. Um, and it, you, you have to find, you like what you're saying, you really have to find out who you are, and you take your 20s to do it. Um, I would actually venture to say you need to reach out to Mike Rowe and get in touch with him with that story because he's just, he would be an amazing – you two sitting down and talking about that I think would be an amazing podcast. What did uh, – Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs. Yeah, but did he quit college too? To do this thing? No, no. He's he's just basically, you know, trying to bring the trades back into the, the spotlight as a yeah. sexy alternative to college and saying, you know, so not everybody's cut out for college. No, that's true. I mean, my old man said that a long time ago. He says, look, if you want to be an architect or a doctor, you know, fine. But, if, but short of that, not necessarily, you know. I mean, if you're not going to be a white-collar person, he, he, he believed that education was done from age – like 11 to 6, 17. That's important. Yeah. And so mm. he sent me away to prep school. I went away to, I went away to prep school. I, I, I turned 12 years old. I graduated in eighth grade at 12 years old in June of 1963. In July, I turned 13. And in August, I went away to prep school for four years, coat and tie, all boys, and neither one of my parents was, has ever been there. Yeah. <laughs> that was, you know, that was, it was rocky, but it was... It was very good for me. You, know? well, you, you had some super hip uh, parents, man, and, and that's, you know, incredible. Uh, you take us back to Clover. So Nick Lowe champions you, right? You're, you're, you recorded a couple records, and there's a new documentary out with Phil, the front man from Thin Lizzy, and he apparently taught you the business of rock, right? Tell us about that a little bit. Well, yeah, it's a little bit. Well, um, yeah, Clover got signed by by um, Phonogram Records and managed by Jake Riviera and Dave Robinson, who also managed Graham Parker, Elvis Costello, Stiff Records, yeah. and all that stuff. But they're, before they did any of that thing, you know, Dave was managing Graham Parker, and 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 Nick had and Jake had Nick Lowe, and that that was all. And so they put partnership on Clover. Clover was a pub rock band. And Clover was actually a groundbreaking band for its day. Before I joined, before Sean and I joined, they were a long-haired country band. John McPhee, the guitar player, he's played with the Doobie Brothers now for the last right. 30 years. He's an incredible musician, wonderful guy, and could just play anything. And they were they made a record in 69 with, you know, couple, uh, uh, overalls on. Yeah hair down to here and, uh, and nudie shirts and 10 foot marijuana plants in back of them. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this is when Willie Nelson had a coat and tie on, on right. the Porter Wagner show. I mean, wow. this was, this was, this was early stuff, you know, um, uh, fine burrito brothers, uh, and Clover, then Cody, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, um, um, so and we ruined that band. They 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 made they made two records on fantasy uh, that um, that never did anything. And those records were released in England on on Liberty Records because there was the A and R guy there was a big was a, with very interesting records, and he distributed them to his bands. One of which were the Chili Willie and the Red Hot Peppers, which was Nick Lowe's outfit and those guys, and they loved the Clover record. So we had no no clue. Oh, Meanwhile, Clover lost a record deal. They 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 were, they were a club band when I saw them, the biggest club band around, but a club band. And then I joined Sean and I, the keyboard player, and we we actually ruined the band. To to be to, to be honest, I mean, we brought we were in on this rhythm and blues kick, 
and they were really a country rock band, a great country rock band. And then we we tried to make this rhythm, and it was just like a mess our, 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 for a while, I think. And I always blame it on Sean and I. But we got signed by Jake and Dave, and Nick Lowe was going to produce our record. They right. flew us to England to do it. But the day we landed, punk hit. And, um, you know, it was wrong, wrong place, wrong time. I mean, we all had hair down to here, and, and it was... Uh, it was, but we saw the punk explosion right before our very eyes from our very office, from Stiff Records' wow. office. I so you're talking like the Clash I and the Ramones. First gig at the Roundhouse. Yeah. I saw the, I saw the Pistols. Yeah. See them. Yeah. Great. So, walked down <laughs> King's Road. Saw my first safety pin in the eye. Ooh. You know, and it and, and, and just blew our minds for, for, for a year. Yeah, and yeah. I loved about the punks was that they were thumbing their nose at the music business, you know? They said, oh, yeah. you know what? We don't care. We don't care what, what you guys say. We're doing our own thing, and we don't care about you. And, and I thought, wow, how liberating. And it's because Clover had for years been trying to make herself look attractive to a record label. Because remember, back then, you had to have a record deal, period. Yeah. There was no internet. There was no jam band scene. There was, there was only one avenue to success, and that was a hit record, period. And yep. so you, we, we just kept grooming ourselves and doing showcases and trying to get these record labels to sign us. And these punks were saying, <laughs> and I went, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah. I said, if this band ever breaks up, I'm going to go back to my hometown. I'm going to get my guys who I really dig, my favorite musicians like Bill Gibson and Johnny Cola, and I'm going to start a band and we're going to play for the hell of it. We're going to have a ball. And that's what Be I did. true to thyself. Yes. And the first yeah. Huey Lewis on the news record was, <laughs> wasn't the first record like 1980? Am I right? 1980. It came out in January of 1980. And it seemed like it was more just, it, I can hear a little bit of that punk influence where it's like less horns and more like driving, you know? Yeah, it, it was, uh, there's some really good songs on that record, I think. Yeah. It was I, I blame myself because w uh, the producer was a guy called Bill Snake. He's a wonderful engineer, and mix engineer. And, you know, he's done, he did all kinds of stuff. Toto, Boss Gags, his record, all this stuff. Oh, wow. So I figured that was my hedge against being too punk, you know, because I knew that. Right. So I figured if I just pushed him as hard as I could, and I said, we got to get in there and we got to cut it fast and live and boom like that. So that's what we did. We got a little studio called American Recorders where Richie Podler cut Let There Be Drums. The first drum ever mic, first guy to ever mic up a kick drum was uh, Richie Podler at, Let the, at the American Recorders. We had rotary knobs. It was a three channel to begin with. And we cut our record there and we played it like twi two times too fast and cut it way too quick. Wow. And, and it sounds like it. it sounds so like where, it. where, what city is that? American Recorders? Is that in Marin County or Los Angeles? Or? We're at Fatburger on Ventura. It's no longer there. Ah. It's right down, you come over Laurel Canyon, mm -hmm. Ventura, you go right, and it's right there, there's Fatburger and then the little American Recorders. Uh, Magic Carpet Ride was cut there. Um, and wow. Richie Potter has Fender, Fender Telecaster number 51 and stuff. It's, it's probably like a, a, con a strip of condos now. Richie Potter went to grade school with Phil Spector, and he's a really good producer, Richie Potter. He cut a lot of early stuff. Him and Bill Cooper, they're partners. And, and it, was, it was a great idea, but what happened is it ended up sounding super, you know, too fast and too small. Yeah. We, but the punk advent, were you a fan of Bad Religion? Were they a big influence for you, too? Because they came up around that time. I'm before that. I'm actually before, before that. that. Yeah. Well, I mean, because the punk punk didn't do too many harmonies, right? Like vocal harmonies. No, no. Time, I, did they? I, musically, there was nothing there for yeah. me. Musically, I, right. I, it was not about music for me, for the punks. Yeah. I just liked that they didn't care about the, their attitude. My thing was, yeah. I never sang any songs because I didn't have a radio voice. Radios, well, well, you know, was remember the uh, yeah. '70s with the yeah. and the and everybody's a tenor and they're and I'm I got this rough ass baritone song. I, I I never sang in Clover because I my voice wasn't radio. I said screw that. I'm if these oh guys gosh. can sing, I can sing. So that that's that was the deal. Was there somebody that was encouraging that said like, well, you really should sing, man? Was it Phil from Thin Lizzy or who was the, the or you just uh, actually Philip Philip 
was very, very instrumental in, in a lot of that because he really took me under his wing. I remember we opened Clover's tour. We opened for Thin Lizzy as yeah. a support, <laughs> right? Thin Lizzy plus support. <laughs> first, first gig is in Oxford. <laughs> Curtain's down. It's going, <laughs> Lizzy. <laughs> Lizzy. We haven't had a sound check. The curtain's down. We're plugging in our amps like crazy, trying to get ready to go. And it's, <laughs> Lizzy. And the curtain goes up to this, right? So it was all we could do to play our set of eight songs and get out of there alive. Wow. We shit right. going at us, and booed out. and everything. But The first show in Oxford, <laughs> just brutal. And after the last song, we learned never, you know, to go from song to song to song. You know, no dead dead air. After the last song, I come off on the wing of the stage and Philip is standing there. He goes, hey, Shuey, hey, do you, you mind if I have a weird with you for a minute? I said, no, love to, you know. And he, he took me under his wing and just said, started talking about our set and what his fans and what people like. And what he taught me is not the biz, uh, but what he taught me was how, how to handle this stuff. You know, Philip was a rock star and he was brilliant. He was sweet as pie to everybody and a big heart. He loved it. You know, he loved it. And he was really, really good at it and how to deal with press, uh, managers, crew, fans, yeah. uh, all that stuff. How he handled all that was really wonderful, man. I learned so much from him. I miss him every single day. He was, and by the way, I don't know if you ever saw Thin Lizzy on stage. Never. On stage, he, nobody could touch Philip. He was, yeah. he, he was the baddest guy I've ever seen on stage. The Rich Redman Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to MusiciansMortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLSConsumerAccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. Well, I was in Dublin, and they have a beautiful, on the square, they have a beautiful statue of him, and I right. took a picture next to it. I mean, so if people aren't familiar with that music, we're, it's like Jailbreak and the Boys Are Back in Town are the two big hits, and, you know, everyone knows it from Pixar, you know, Toy Story. Um, but great, fantastic music, and just what a loss. Jim, would, you got a question? Yeah, I was, you know, I only brought the the bad religion aspect into it because they're known for their harmonies. Right. And you guys, and it's so surprising to me to hear that you never considered yourself to be a, a singer, and you yep. have one of the one of the most unbelievable harmonics in the history of rock and roll. I mean, yeah. that's that's what my brother wanted to ask about. Is that how did you guys, you know, did you warm up? I mean, how did that kind of so, how did you stumble upon on that? Well, we 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 got lucky with the blend, and and interestingly. Our, our great, our, you know, everybody in the band sings. You know, we're a real band, right? I mean, I, yeah. our strength is a, as a band. And um, everybody in the band sings. Johnny is, is, does most of the vocal arrangement, and he sings wonderfully. You know, he's a, he's a lead singer and a singer. And, and what's weird is that he's like a third above me. You know, he's, 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 he's a tenor, and I'm a baritone, and I'm perfect. And, and he, but he, but we have, Almost the same voice. It's a weird thing. In fact, I went back and listened to our first album because we're thinking about trying to. 
a little bit. And I sound like Johnny Cola. I say, Johnny, it sounds like you singing. He says, I know. It's weird, right? And now, years later, I'm lower down. It's just very interesting. But we were blessed with that, that kind of a blend. Uh, it's an interesting one because Bill sings, a drummer, yeah. and he's got from the knife because he's got a voice. You just, it just pierces, you know? So it's, it's an interesting wow. blend. It's not, it's not a perfect blend, but it's, but it's our blend. And, and you know, it's, you, sound what you, you sound like what you sound like. You know? Yeah. Do so you guys warm up backstage? Of the, of the 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. big time. We, 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 we always, that's how we started singing a cappella stuff. Because we we would warm up backstage, and we'd sing our own songs backstage. We get so sick of singing our own songs, we wanted to sing them twice. You know, <laughs> we start just riffing on Chain Gang or something, you know. And then uh, then we put one in the set, and it went down well. So we we started doing that. Now, did I read correctly somewhere that you guys self produced the sports record? Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. wow. So I mean, how does that? Is it a true democracy? How are decisions made? Yeah, How does that work? You know, uh, the buck probably stops with me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we all, we, we produce as a band. I mean, no question about it. Just a bunch of guys cutting a song, you know. Yeah. Well, it's, that's not brain surgery. You, you've done it a many times. Yeah. Well, you, it's just, so what happened was our, our first, after our first record, which was my fault, but it was produced by Bill Schnee. So Schnee took the blame. Schnee took the hit and it didn't do anything, you know. <laughs> But I learned a lot, a ton, and, and so on our second record, we produced. Then we we auditioned a bunch of producers, and it was pretty. And by this point, you know, I I'd made records with Clover, with Mutt Langer, so I knew my way around the studio a little bit. Nice. So did Johnny, and we, you know, so we said we can do this. You know, we don't need to, we don't want to give anybody any points and all that stuff anyway. You know, it's just so my manager believed in us and he convinced the record label, which is very rare. It was in the early eighties. Nobody, you know, if you were a record label, you didn't let a band go off and produce themselves. Nowadays, everybody, nowadays you get the, you get the finished copy. We, we, they had nothing to hear, but these crappy little demos. And they were yeah. like, man, we're gonna let this band do their own stuff. But, but our manager browbeat them into allowing us. And they were 7,000 miles away and Crystal's records in London couldn't really control us. So we did it ourselves. And, and we knew we were going to have, think about it, it's 1982, 80, 80, sports is cut in 81-ish, 81, 82, right? Yeah. And it's a radio world entirely. There's no internet. There's no jam band. The CHR format is everything. See, contemporary hit radio. Because MTV has started, and yeah. MTV is, play, is playing exactly mirroring R&R Records playlist. Yeah. Radio never those hits in those early 80s are the biggest hits there ever will be there yeah. will never be another hit that big you know where everybody hears it on it and your chr stations are playing at 10 they're banging it 10 times a day you know all the, all the stations in new york and all that stuff so that's what you had to compete and so we wanted to we knew we needed to do that but we wanted to make those choices ourselves. I was worried that, you know, you get a producer and then you get something that you can't stand or whatever. So, so we aimed every song right at radio, but we didn't want them to be the same because we, you know, we didn't know what was going to stick. So we, here's your rocker. Here's your ballad. Here's your, uh, 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 you know, uh, country ish, uh, yeah. uh, what root rootsy song, whatever. Yeah. And, and, you know, because we knew we needed a hit single. Yeah. And we didn't know we were going to have five of them, but we knew we needed one. And that's why we did that song. I mean, you guys did good. And those five are the heart of rock and roll, heart and soul, I want a new drug, walking on a thin line, if this is it. Good job. Yeah. Self-produced. I mean, that is amazing. And you know what it makes me think of as like a, you know, Bay Area music fan? There's another band that some people may have heard of. Tower of Power, right? A musician's musician's band, right? And you guys have a similar lineup, but you are the guys that are household names. I mean, it's like you were, were the part of the fabric of pop culture and not so much. So I don't know the difference between the two, the decisions you made, maybe the management. Do you have the same management from back in the day, this, the whole time? Well, we don't have it. I don't have I'm. You're looking at the management. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, and yeah, I've been doing this for at least five years. Well, probably be yeah, longer than that. Yeah, we split, we split up with our manager a long time ago. So. Wow. But uh, 
I mean, no, I mean, Tower, Tower's fantastic. I mean, you know, if you want to go see a good band, and they're playing really good right now. They're really oh, good yeah. friends of ours. And, and uh, Doc, you know, Doc, Doc, baritone player, Doc Cooper, he, I mean, he wrote every song. I mean, he's wrote all those songs. And it's heavy. He's, oh, he's, I'm, he's I'm a huge amazing. fan too. I just, yeah. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, but their stuff is, is super funky. You know, it's not, oh, yeah. it's like food, really. I mean, there's foie gras and then there's hamburgers. You know what I mean? And so, you know, I, I've never been, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm unapologetic about being a pop music guy i'm a pop music guy i mean what is i mean yeah. popular is popular music that's what we're doing this isn't jazz it isn't right. it isn't classical it's popular music and music is part of it but it's right. only part of it. Uh, it, it it's more of a cultural thing we're doing here and and otherwise why would one record sell eight million and another record sell eight doesn't make any sense <laughs> well there's a nerve stuck there somehow right and that's that we're all trying to do reinvent that thing and so on and that and a good part of that is the muse coming to you, so it's fortune, and it's and it's also recognizing when it's there and all that. So you know, and and a lot of it's good fortune. So sure. Yeah. Now, and Tower's two, doing fine. I mean, they're, oh they're yeah, fine. They're playing. they'll never yeah. stop. And then I thought, you know, kind of in the. 80s when they came out with that record monster on a leash i caught i kind of said well maybe there's some like they, maybe they'll really cross over now you know but there's still a band that can put all those butts and seats at the you know on, at a big venue in los angeles i mean it's it's great it's amazing that you mentioned that song monster on a leash i gave that to doc really That's doc. i didn't yeah, know well, that <laughs> You know when you when you have when you have a few drinks after the show, yeah, you got a he has a monster. They got a monster. Some guys name their monster. Yeah, say so, yeah, you got to come on a leash though. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, you got so many so many great that's, stories. That's, that's awesome. that's oh my god, about. that is so funny. See, there's something about not over researching here. I just stumbled on that one. Um, Two two things that maybe people in our audience would like to know about, and that is working with Zemeckis and and Michael J. Fox and and the big film Back to the Future, and or your involvement with uh, Quincy Jones and the We Are the World thing. It kind of all happened around the same time. Yeah, well, you know, the, uh, the Back to the Future, Zemeckis, um, Bob Zemeckis. Uh, uh, Sorry, Steven Spielberg, Robert Zemeckis, Bob Gale, and Neil Canton, who direct, you know, produced, directed, and wrote the picture, uh, had a meeting with us and said, uh, 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 with my manager and I, and they said, um, uh, you know, we've just written this film and we have this character called Marty McFly, and his favorite band would be Huey Lewis in the News. So we thought, how would you like to write a song for this film? I said, flattered but I, I don't know how to write for film necessarily. And, and I don't fancy writing a song, I'm just be honest, um, called Back to the Future. And they said, oh, no, we, it doesn't have to be called Back to the Future. Call it just one of your songs. I said, oh, okay, well, uh, next thing I, I, uh, I, we write, we'll send you. And Power Love is the next thing we wrote. Wow. Nice. Well, I'm and glad you did. Time. Yeah. That was a good one, too. Yeah. Well, interestingly, you know, the song went to number one, the fastest we've song we've had to number one. But in those days, you know, you had to build a single at CHR. That's a, I don't even know what, what they do anymore. But in those days, you release a record, and you, you, you get most added. And then the next week you get, you know, most added again. Then you, then you got so many stations. You're not going to be most added, but you get hot. Or you get, yeah. meaning you're getting reactions or good phones. or And based on all of this stuff, they they chart your single. And you get the numbers on Tuesday, every day, every Tuesday. And we would just wait for those numbers. Power Love was just, forget about it. It was the most added. And, blah, blah. and the movie wasn't finished. And so wow. they, 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 they wrapped principal shooting and then um, and got it to the theaters in nine weeks. So it's still a record over there in Hollywood. And the reason they did, it's because Power Love was soaring up the charts. Wow. When the movie was released. Power of Love was the number one, was, was number one. The, the week that Back to the Future came out, Power of Love was already number one. Yeah. So that's And great, it was being yeah. used in production pieces too, because you had, back then, this is really going to age me, um, 
I would come home from the sixth grade and get my snacks together, <laughs> my after school snack, and watch he, uh, Garfield and Heathcliff. And they would use that song in the promos for those cartoons. Wow. Okay. Yep. I wonder if I got paid for that. <laughs> I think you should look into that. My uh, brother's I, an attorney. He can uh, he can do that for you. You got to check with um, SAG after, man. Yeah. They... <laughs> that's, so, um, no. I love that, man. And so, and then the, the then the acting thing. You know, does was that little cameo in that piece? Did that give you the bug, or did you have a little bit of that thing happening? Because now you're playing yourself in an episode of The Blacklist with James Spader. That had to be fun, right? Yeah, it, it's something I, 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 I always heretofore have never done. I don't like to play myself. You know? right. I like to act. It's fun. And, and especially when, I can, when it's creative and the, and the other actors are good. That, yeah. that, you know, it's some, and, and, and unfortunately, you don't get that, that off. Even, even great actors, you know, you, they're starving for parts. I mean, you know, so, and there's a lot of people. And I don't get the great parts because, you know, I'm not an actor, right, by, by trade. But, but I like to act, and it's fun when I can do stuff like that. And, um, but, and I don't like to play myself because that's easy. But, but the thing with this one is, in this particular episode, it's I have to act as myself. Does that make any sense? Yeah. You know, I had, to, I had yeah. a shtick I got to do. <clears throat> Where I pretend I'm a, uh, that all this stuff happened, and I give a speech at the at the character's memorial, like I, he was my best friend. I have to I have to pretend that he's my best friend, sure, and that he's my muse for his mother, because Re Raymond Reddington asked me to, and yeah. you do what Raymond Reddington asked you to do. So, but I remember uh, Howard Stern there was, talking. There was about some that. acting. There was some acting required. You know, right, 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 right. Howard. Howard Stern played himself in private parts. He said the most, the challenging thing about that was remembering how he acted in his youth. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, that would be a challenge. That would well, be, you yeah. kind of put yourself I mean, in that headspace again. One of my life dreams is to get on a sitcom set and you got to do a couple episodes of Hot in Cleveland. Now, wasn't that with Betty White? Yeah, this was, I mean, it was really fun, man. I mean, you know, Tell us I about not that. only did I, I did four episodes of, of Hot in Cleveland with Betty White, you know, uh, Valerie Bertinelli, yep. uh, Jane Leaves, and, uh, and Wendy Malick, my, my pal, Wendy's, you know, and so, and she was my love interest on it. So it's fantastic. First of all, they're great. And Betty White's unbelievable. But now on the, on the, I did the last episode of the whole rap and I get to marry Bob Newhart. And Betty White, they get married by a fake Huey Lewis in Vegas. And I got the red suit only. I weigh 300 you. pounds now. And, uh, yeah. and it, but, but it was a two-week deal. And I got to share really next door dressing room with Bob Newhart. And, uh, and, and you know, that was really cool. Yeah. I mean, well, it's funny because you mentioned that show, Hot in Cleveland. It sounds like it could be a Huey Lewis and the News song. <laughs> it does. And... The heart of rock and roll is in Cleveland. Yes. Uh, I'm surprised they didn't ask you to do the theme. Too bad they didn't, right? I know, right? <laughs> that would have been more money. Sitcoms are the dreams because they just syndicate like nobody's business. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really good, man. Wow. And the new record, you know, I was going to ask you about, do you have an affinity or an appreciation for like, old country and western music because there's a song uh one of the boys that's got a harmonica and a steel guitar who plays the steel guitar on that john mcphee i sent ah. it to him and he he killed it he sent it back he, i just sent it to him he sent it back it was just awesome wow um, yeah that song uh, see i i love duke ellington said there's only two kinds of music good and bad and that's yep, true yeah. but so do i like country music i love country music Right. Not so fond of modern country. Yeah, you probably don't like us. Yeah. <laughs> I got a line in my. I got a line in. Um, Remind me why I love you again. He goes, I'm blue. You're uh, what is it? Uh, uh, you don't cook and you won't clean. You can't even. You can't even run. You don't even, a washing machine. Oh, uh, you, you can't stand spicy food. You like modern country. I like rhythm and blue. Yeah, that's from Remind Me Why I Love You Again yeah. on the new record. <laughs> But, That's a great record. It's like a trip down, like the style. It's like a styles journey. It's like there's. No, I, 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 I know that we were warned against that since day one. We 
I can't help it. I can't help it. It's just you, you know, you, you, you record the songs, you write and record the songs that you're given. They, right, they're, yeah. they're absolute gifts to you. And, and you just got to follow the song. The song tells you how it wants to, wants to be cut. It's right. not, it's not, you know, it's, well, let's make, let's make this one a funk tune. It has to be, it has to be, I think. Yeah. So. Like that's that one's got like a James Brown, you know, wah wah guitar thing, and then there's Pretty Girls Everywhere. It's just total fifties doo wop. That, that's kind of a great story, Pretty Girls Everywhere. That's that's Eugene Church. That's a cover. That's the only cover we did on the record. Okay. It's Eugene Church, and and when we toured in probably ninety one, maybe we took Neville Brothers on tour with us. Opened mm. up, and we had we took Stevie Ray Vaughan on his very first national tour wow and we took the neville brothers in the very first we took shed tours you know we did like 40 days yeah right. we sat in with them every night it was awesome and one of these times uh, aaron said to me man you ever heard a tune by called pretty girls everywhere by eugene church i said nope he says you need to do that song man i said and you know when aaron says you need to do that song yeah oh okay and he, then he gave me the single a little vinyl single of Eugene Church. Uh, and I forgot all about it. And I found it about four years ago or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I put it on and went, that is a great idea. So we got it for the record. And nice. I told him he was overjoyed. But, but, but yeah. That's a good one. And there are pretty girls everywhere, man. Dang. Everywhere I go. <laughs> they, they, they come on horses. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm at the radio, they come on horses. When I'm at the rodeo, they come on horses. Yes, that's a great one, man. Everyone's got to check out the record. Mermaid, Weather, mermaids. Uh, what is it? Mermaids fly, uh, swimming like a whale. Splish, splash, splish, splash, splish, splash, splish, splash. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's ridiculous. What's your what's your guys like as a band? I haven't like researched like you know who who wrote a lot of the songs. I'm sure you have a hand in nearly everything. Like in Nashville, you know the songwriting capital of the world. 10 a.m. on a Monday morning, there's gonna be like two guys in a room with two acoustic guitars. Like, what happened over the weekend? What's going on in your life? One guy comes in with a couple of chords. One guy comes in with a title. Next thing you know, they're bringing it to a demo session band. It's very mechanized, and there's this big machinery. What's your guys' writing process? Are you writing uh, with a keyboard, and then you make a little garage band demo, and then you bring it to life? Are you writing on the studio floor? How do you guys handle it? Well, you know. First of all, um, we're not very prolific. You know, I mean, we've, it's not as if we just write, 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 and, and, and write 10 songs to get one. It's a, not, there's none of that involved, zero. Yeah. Funny, you know, I was, I, I was with, Glenn Fry was a buddy of mine, and we were, we were playing golf at the AT&T at Pebble Beach, and being interviewed by this guy, Scott, uh, Scott Osser, who's a wonderful sports writer in San Francisco. And, um, and, he, and he was a fan, and, and he said, man, between you two guys, you must have written thousands of songs. I bet you got millions of songs you never used. I said, not me. No. <laughs> yeah, I got nothing. You, you heard everyone I wrote. And, and Glenn says, same with me. He says, every single song. I've used everything I've ever written. He says, I, he says really? I thought you'd written something. He says, Glenn says, show me a guy who's written 100 songs. I'll show you 96 pieces of shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add that. Okay, I'm going to transition to a question says, if right write, now. If you write four great songs. Right. Yeah. Like, forget about it. Yeah, but you got to write 100 to find those, to find those four. I guess. Yeah. But, but I mean, there's a, there's a divine, like, you know, touch of inspiration because you're definitely one of those bands and one of those artists that have had you've defined a generation. You, you, you're you on the soundtrack of the 80s and the 90s yeah. and such. So, I mean, it's, there, there are songs that you just hear and you're like, oh my gosh, it takes you back. They have longevity and uh, they, they kind of have a staple on society and culture at the time. In your opinion, in this day and age, uh, what artists out there do you think have that kind of, there's not many of them these days is what I guess the point I'm trying to make. Anybody come to mind in, in the modern times that, that really kind of make an impression on you that we're going to know and go, Oh my gosh, I remember that song 10, 20 years from now. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there, I think there's plenty of artists, but I think the, the landscape has changed so much yeah. that you can't have a, a hit like you used to have. You can't have, you just can't, 
as big of audio is just not a big, big enough part of the pie anymore, of the show business pie. Right. Audio is just this big. People want to watch the screen. They want to build, and, and audio has shrunk since, you know, the, the, when's the heyday? 30s and 40s. 30s and 40s. America learned how to behave for music, watching, listening to the thing. We learned, and I like New York in June. Oh, how about you? We learned what's cool and what isn't cool. All that from music was was our information source. Believe it or not, there was no Google. There was no. It was, it was the radio. It was music. And yeah. now, now that you just can't have that impact anymore. Yeah, I don't think TikTok is breaking a ton of the artists these days. Today are the ads like the like the um, the Geico ad. You know, or da 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 or whatever. Well, yeah, well, I can't remember. But, you know, some, some of these ads you, you hear all the time, that whoa, that's the, you know. There, there's Flo. There's the, the Geico of Salamander. Yeah. And, you know, interestingly, <laughs> enough, like, where do you hear real blues, real R&B, uh, like, where do you hear, oh, I don't know, you know, Howlin' Wolf or something like you that? Know. There's no radio station that plays Howlin' Wolf or anything. You know where you hear it? You hear it on a, on a, on a Honda ad. Or a, yeah, or, yeah. Or, a, or a or a you know some kind of corporate ad, an IBM ad or something. You know, you go, yeah, wow, that's good. Guardians of the Galaxy movie. Yeah, the music supervisors <laughs> in those Marvel movies are amazing. And are. I mean, I mean, they pick some real winners. Shuffles and twelve eight rhythm and blues songs are dead on the radio. Like, because you know, when I teach drum students today, they don't know how to play shuffles because they don't have a cultural relationship with them because they're not being recorded. I almost feel I like the shows. last. Oh, that is so true. Yeah, it was yeah, like yes. Glass Tiger or something had a hit in like, you know, 89 or something with that. Oh, that is so true, what yeah. you just said. That's right. But you know, you, uh, you know you, a shuffle's got to be feel. And, yeah. and, and feel is, is a whole separate thing. And you can, machines don't have feel, yeah. period. No. They got perfect time, but they don't have feel. And these know, times, so I think sir, the times we go through right now serve to help us remember what is good when it comes back. So it's like going through the valleys. You got in order to get, you got to go through the valleys to appreciate the mountaintops. What do you mean? The, the COVID or the technology? What do you, which oh, one and everything. I, yeah. I think COVID and everything that we're going through right now, even musically, you know, I mean, uh, eventually it all comes back and eventually people start appreciating real human music again. It's got to come back. I yeah. hope. No. There's this kid. You get, heard this kid, Jamie Alexander. You heard him play piano. No, the little no. I think he's a Taiwanese kid. What is he like nine or something? Yeah, he's fourteen. I think oh, now. 14. 14, 15. God, he's old. He's, he's so old for an influencer. You, 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 what Joey Alexander? You got to Google him when he get off. Okay, he's unbelievable. Mark it down. He can play Giant Steps. Oh my God! Uh, oh. Well, that's impressive. A prodigy. So what's interesting is this is going to occur on the side anyway. You know, there's going to be that. That's real music. That's, that's real music. You know, that's not pop music. Yeah. That's, 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 that's the real deal right there. Yeah, man. So when this goes away and it becomes, we get the, the, the green light for us to go entertain and take the music to the people again. Is that on the plan? You guys going to go out there and promote weather? or what's, What are you thinking? I can't. I can't. I can't hear uh, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to try. Yeah. I haven't given up yet, but that's almost, almost. That's inspirational. I see the golf clubs back there. My old man's got two hole in ones. Not okay. bad. Yeah. I, I mean, like, how do you do that? That he's like practice like the drums, man. He plays four <laughs> times a week, man. Does he? Where, yeah. where's he? He's in uh port Charlotte, Florida. <laughs> that's the right place to be. Hey, right. Four times a week. Hey, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, four times a week, absolutely. I mean, I what a random question. Montana. You can't. I call it. You know, we can't play four times a week in Montana. Some weeks we can. But. Yeah. What a year! I mean, Nashville, Nashville alone, we had tornadoes, a pandemic, and now snowstorms, and now poor Texas. Oh, it's like this is crazy. An explosion! Don't forget about the explosion. Oh, we had the yeah. explosion to Oh my yeah. God! Incredible. Mom. We'll get through it. Yeah. As humanity, we yeah. always do. We always do. And what a legacy, man. And, and I just want to thank you for all the music and all the great things, man. 
but it didn't hurt a bit. Good to be with you guys. Fantastic. <laughs> I know it was a thrill for Jim as well. And to all the oh, listeners absolutely. out there, yeah, man, what, what a great time. Uh, be sure to uh, subscribe, share, rate, and review. And you got some positive feedback. We got an email address for you, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. As always, keep coming back for the good stuff. Huey, thank you so much. You bet. Good to see you, Rich. Jim, see you, boys. See you guys. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com.